Yes, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. I'm happy to be here. We hope that all of us stay healthy and that those affected by COVID will recover quickly. Welcome to the second webinar, Global Framework for Sustainable Palm Oil, held by CPOPC, the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, 2nd March 2022 at 9 p.m. Jakarta. I saw here in on the registration list, there are participants or representatives from Indonesia, Malaysia, and 16 other countries. Hope that this webinar can fulfill the needs. Just for your information, CPOPC developed the global framework of principle for sustainable palm oil. This framework aims to create a common language across the different certification scheme being applied to palm oil producing guided by the SDG. This framework can be subsequently used to value the contribution of palm oil toward achieving sustainable development in all producing countries, and also shall lay the foundation for the establishment of sustainability of vegetable oil platform. So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Vichaksono Dharmo Sarkoro. I will be your moderator throughout this webinar, supported by our technical team, Ms. Feni, Ms. Mala, and Ms. Tinka. Well, before we start, kindly mute your microphone, especially when the speakers are presenting. And also please use the chat facility to raise your questions, or you can raise your hand by that time. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the second webinar to socialize global framework for sustainable palm oil to broader audience and international wide stakeholders. Today, we will be having the opening, opening statement by the executive director of CPOPC, continued with remarks by the deputy minister for food and agribusiness, uh, CMEA, represented by Mr. Muhammad Edi Yusuf, the assistant to the deputy, and a special address will be delivered by Dr. Agus Prabowo, the senior management advisor, UNDB Indonesia. Then we will have photo session for just two minutes. Shortly mentioned also that the presenter, presenters are Mr. Ziv Raguski, a sustainability expert, and Dr. Shata Drew Chato Patei, Managing Director Solidarity Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to start the web. We would like to invite Dato Tansri Dr. Yusuf Basiron. Uh, just a minute. To Basiron uh, for the opening uh, statement. Welcome, Tansri Yusuf. Floor is yours. Thank you, Pak Wijak. Good day. Selamat pagi. And on behalf of the organizer, CPOXI, or Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, I welcome you to today's special webinar entitled Global Framework for Sustainable Palm Oil, Sustainability Standard for All Vegetable Oils. Firstly, I would like to extend my regards to our distinguished guests for today's session, uh, Honorable Pa Eddie Yusof, Assistant to Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture Business, Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs, Republic of Indonesia. Also to Bapa Dr. Agus Prabowo, Senior Management Advisor, Head of Environmental Unit, UNDP Indonesia. Next, I would like to extend my greetings to our valuable experts and speakers, Zif Ragoski and Dr. Shatadru Chatopadaya. Yeah. And to all participants who are joining us this morning, I would like to thank you for all your kind presence. Today's webinar is the last session from its first series that aims to introduce Global Framework Principle for Sustainable Palm Oil or GFP SPO to international audiences beyond palm oil producing countries. Therefore, for those of you who were with us last time during the first series of this webinar, welcome back and I'm pleased to see you all again. Similarly with this previous webinar, today's session serves as a preparation towards having the GFP SPO presented to the United Nations High-Level Political Forum 
GFHLPF in July 2022 in the hope that GFPSPO will be known globally and will receive the support that it deserves from producing countries. Going forward, the ultimate goal of GFPSPO is collaboration among all vegetable oils to make sustainability a norm. On behalf of the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, I want to emphasize that this GFSPO would not contradict the sovereignty of any country as GFSPO will not replace the existing certification schemes such as Indonesia's ISPO, Indonesian uh, Sustainable Palm Oil and Malaysian MSPO. Instead, the role of GFPSPO is to be an acceptable sustainability reference among all vegetable oils. Once again, it is important to stress the achievements of palm oil in achieving sustainability. Palm oil has achieved 13 goals or objectives out of the 17 United Nations, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals or UN SDGs, accommodating the, 30, the three pillars, social, economic, and environmental. The establishment of the Global Framework for Sustainable Palm Oil. GFSPO adds more emphasis that sustainable palm oil is here to stay. Therefore, our role is to share this information as widely as we can beyond the industry key players, and especially to those who are dismissive towards palm oil. In summary, let me explain why we need GFSPO. Developing countries still need to develop especially its agriculture sector, their agriculture sector. But the EU has imposed a de facto ban on agricultural development by their no deforestation green deal. Even just projecting oil palm expansion uh, based on past trend that could cause deforestation has prompted the EU to pass a law called RED2 to ban palm oil from being used as biofuel. That's how serious things could be uh, with regard to developing our agriculture sector using the traditional, the old approach where deforestation is involved. But there is a solution and the problem can be solved if we adopt this uh, framework. You, uh, which is the framework called GFP SPO, which is based on US, UN SDG uh, sustainable uh, commitment. So that's why we are focusing to uh, uh, engage all uh, stakeholders to adopt GFP SPO in their agriculture development and commodity production. Uh, for the future and overcome the uh, so-called problems imposed with the ban on deforestation, ban on agriculture development as imposed by the EU. So before I end my remarks, it is my hope that everyone here will support the Global Framework for Sustainable Palm Oil towards the achievement of all 17 SDGs. I hope you will make use of this valuable time to learn from our sustainability experts and speakers as they share their knowledge about GFSPO. Lastly, I wish you all another fruitful session, and I sincerely hope that everyone will learn some important insights on the uh, importance of adopting the GFPSPO for a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Back to you, Paul Jack. Thank you, Tantri Yusuf, for your opening statement to highlight the importance of the webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now coming to the opening remarks. It's a great pleasure for us to invite Mr. Muhammad Edi Yusuf to represent the opening remarks from the Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture, I'm sorry, Agribusiness, Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs, Republic of Indonesia. Mr. Edi Yusuf, time is yours. 
Thank you, Pak Bicak. On behalf of the Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture and uh, Food and Agribusiness, I would like to express her apologies for not being able to attend the webinar this morning. Therefore, please allow me, Assistant Deputy Minister for Estate Crop Agribusiness Development, I'm Muhammad Adi Yusuf, to deliver the eponic opening remarks of the Deputy Deputy. Good morning to all of you from Jakarta, Indonesia. First, I would like to extend my greeting to my fellow uh, yang berbahagia, Datuk Rafi Mutayah, Secretary General of the Ministry of Plantation Industries and Communities Malaysia, Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Yusof Basiron, Executive Director of the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, to all speakers, Bapak Dr. Agus Prabowo, Senior Management Advisor, Head of Environment Unit UNDP Indonesia, Dr. Satadru Jato Padaye, Managing Director Solidaridad Asia, Mr. Ziz Rakowski, Sustainability Consultant and Agriculture Technology Enthusiast. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to give this opening remarks at this second webinar on Global Principle for Sustainable Palm Oil, GFPSPO, organized by CIPOPSI. This webinar meets one of the seven objectives of CIPOPSI, which is to strengthen cooperation and collaboration among other palm oil producing countries. At today's webinar, all the palm oil producing countries, including observer, CIPOPSI observer countries, are invited to meet under one collaborative platform to inform and update the global framework principle of sustainable palm oil. As global demand for edible oil keeps growing and is used in almost everything human needs, palm oil is now the most consumed vegetable oil globally. CIPOPSI developed a framework that can subsequently use to value the contribution of palm oil toward achieving sustainable development in all producing countries. I'm pleased to welcome the, the completions of the CIPOPSI Global Framework of Principle of Sustainable Palm, Palm Oil. This framework will be useful for developing global sustainability reference on palm oil, as well as highlights the leadership of palm oil in ensuring the sustainability of all vegetable oils. Today's discussion is the second discussion about GFP SPO to inform the gist of the GSP SPO, including the way forward and garner wider support. We appreciate that CIPOPSI, who has taken follow-up step to disseminate the framework content to stakeholders of palm oil producing countries, stakeholders of other vegetable oils, and other international partner or organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, moving forward, we need to be constantly vigilant on the global vegetable oil market developments. Palm oil is an important vegetable oil needed to address the global demand. With global demand for vegetable oil increasing, producer oil should respond by offering more sustainable vegetable oil sources and supporting a solid framework to promote sustainability. CIPOPSI has initiated the Global Framework of Principle of Sustainable Palm, Palm Oil. This framework aims to create a common language across the different certification scheme being applied to palm oil products production and core in the UN SDGs as its base. Palm oil producing countries have adopted several sustainability certification standards and these frameworks include the AISPO, MSPO, and ISPO. In collaboration and support of the current certification schemes, the GFP SPO can provide a common language across systems and benchmarks. It is worth noting that this framework is voluntary and is not intended to, to be a new palm oil certification scheme, but rather a critical reference applicable to the existing and future schemes. There are seven sustainability principles compiled in the GFP SPO. 
which is explored more by one of the speakers today. Ladies and gentlemen, now that we have the global framework of principle on sustainable palm oil, CPOPC has to provide the necessary steps taken soonest to deliberate this framework with relevant international partners, especially the UN system, to, to help realize our common vision to develop one standard of sustainability for all edible oils. There should be a bridge from the following steps to be brought up to the, to, to the UN and to other producing countries as a base to, to develop a global standard. Once we agree and engage with the UN on this TFP SPO, we expect to broaden our reach to other vegetable oils. Ladies and gen gentlemen, before concluding, I would like to thank all the speakers, distinguished guests, and participants for attending this webinar. My sincere thanks also to the CPOPC Secretariat for arranging this event. Lastly, I truly hope that today's webinar can facilitate fruitful discussions, inspire all participants to believe that the palm oil industry is here to stay sustainably and ruminatively in 2022 and for many years to come. And also, more and more people around the globe know CPOPC as a reputable international organization in promoting palm oil. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak Edi Yusuf, for your opening remarks, as well as the direction representing the government of Indonesia in CPOPC. Well, yes, Pak Edi, I also see uh, Datuk Rafi from MPIC. Good morning, Datuk. Hope that everything is good. Ladies and gentlemen, the upcoming one is the special address. Welcome to Dr. Agus Prabowo, the Senior Management Advisor, Head of Environment Unit, UNDP Indonesia. We are waiting for your special address, sir. Audience is yours. Thank you very much, Pak Wicaksono. Bismillahirrohmanirrohim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi and very good morning to you all. It is my pleasure to see all of you, although virtually. On the outset, I'd like to acknowledge our partners, Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Yusuf Basiron, Executive Director of CPOPC, and then Pa Ed Yusuf, my colleague from Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs, Datuk Sri Datu, maaf, Datu Rafi Mutaya, Secretary General, Ministry of Plantation Industries and Commodities of Malaysia, and our distinguished speakers, Mr. Zif Ragowski, Sustainability Consultant and Agricultural Technology Enthusiast, and Dr. Satadru Chattopadayai, Managing Director, Solidaridad Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNDP Indonesia, I would like to convey our concern that we are all still in difficult condition and are learning to deal with the spread of the Omicron virus. Let me join in praying for those who are in the recovery stage to get well soon, keeping safe from the exposure of the virus and stay healthy for all of you. I thank you for the invitation and the request to deliver a special session in this event. I can see major actors that play key roles and contributions in development of sustainable palm oil in Indonesia have joined virtually. I optimize that your involvement will be able to promote and demonstrate proven examples in sustainable palm oil production system. Please allow me to be back on 23rd September, 2021. The UN Food System and Summit was held in New York virtually. Bring together key players from the world of science, businesses, 
policy as well as farmers, indigenous people, youth organizations, and many other key stakeholders. As we enter the decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030, this summit highlighted that many of the world food system were fragile and not fulfilling the right to adequate food for all. Hunger was on the rise again. Three billion people, and that almost half all humanity, could not afford a healthy diet. The reason why I started my remarks by bringing the food issue into today's webinar is because palm oil has many dimensions to it including their connection to food system. Palm oil certainly has different meaning and sentiment to different people in different location at, at different times. The discourse of palm oil indeed are very dynamic. They are socially, ecologically, economically, and politically intertwined. Ladies and gentlemen, we must not forget that the world population is expected to reach 8.6 billion by the year 2030 and 9.8 billion by 2050, which certainly poses a problem of sustainability in itself. The debate over palm oil is an example of the complexity of producing food for a world population that has quadrupled in the last 100 years and continue to grow, especially in developing countries. On that note, when, part, when practiced in a sustainable way, palm oil has a great potential to contribute to improving the state of local food system. We are all part of the food system. And so we, are, we all must come together to bring about the transformation that the world needs. The global framework of principle for sustainable palm oil, as we will discuss today, reflecting the excellent work of C. Popsi is one example of the effort the distinctive approach and perspective of this framework is specifically addressing the SDGs, and it is great appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share with you the UNDP global, that UNDP globally has portfolio related to food and agricultural commodity system, or FACS which built on decades of UNDP support across food system with current portfolio of 1.2 billion US dollar of technical assistance in more than 100 countries and close to 400 landscapes. Our overall aim is to strategically support country driven transformations of 30 national food system by 2030. Emphasis will be placed on achieving the following three primary interconnected results. First, large scale sustainable production landscape and jurisdictions. Second, sustainable food and agricultural commodity supply chain. And third, empowerment of vulnerable rural household and smallholder producers. On national context, I'm also pleased to share that currently UNDP and FAO have co-signed a new GEF funded project nationally led by the Indonesian Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs where Ibu Mustalifa herself has been the leading actor. The project called Food System Land Use and Restoration, or FOLUR, 
which is expected to improve the livelihood of smallholder farmers at the sub-national levels and to strengthen the sustainable food value chain of main commodities, namely coffee, cacao, rice, and also palm oil. As an international development agency and a development partner to the Indonesian government, UNDP affirms its position as a convener and neutral agent between stakeholders and fostering multi-stakeholder collaboration for systemic change. Our value lies in working in partnership to leverage collective specialized knowledge and expertise for moving towards achieving the SDGs. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, echoing the message from the UN Food System Summit, making our food systems more sustainable is among the most powerful ways to change course and make progress toward all 70s, 17 sustainable development goals. Rebuilding the food system of the world will contribute to build forward better from COVID-19 and a sustainable palm oil management can be potentially be part of that. Today's event will also be a great opportunity to, but not only share information to wider public about the contribution of CPOPC to an improved palm oil governance, but also to learn from each other about this very important topic. Looking forward, we should move towards not seeing human development program and environmental conservation and advocacy as inherently opposed, but instead this should become the basis for mutual transformative dialogue to progress with the SDGs and to create a healthier planet. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to you, Pak Wicaksono. Thank you, Dr. Agus Prabowo from UNDP Indonesia for your special address, the way in achieving sustainability contributed by palm oil with the global framework. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time for us to take photos first before uh, we are not remember at all. <laughs> so, Secretariat, Ms. Mala, are you ready? Yes, Pak. Please turn your screen on, all of you. So, uh, of course, your smile wide open, please. Ready for page one, Mala? One, two, three. Yes. Now for page two. One, two, three. Actually, how many pages you have there, Mala? Miss Mala? Six, Pak. Six. Okay then, page three, ready? One, two, three. Page four. One, two, three. Page five. One, two, three. The last one. One, two, three. Ready? Thank you very much. Great. It, it was nice. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now entering the presentation session. Uh, there are two speakers. The first speakers, the spot. The first speaker is Mr. Ziv Rakowski, an MBA from Inset. He is a consultant in the field of sustainability and also an agricultural technology enthusiast. Some of his work, a consultant in in McKinney and Co, CEO of Maha Microfinance for Agriculture, Myanmar board member of Blue Number, and focus also with Governor of Indonesia, Papnas on Agricultural Innovation in Palm Oil. He will be presenting the concept of global framework of principle for sustainable palm oil. Mr. Sif Rakowski, you have about 20 minutes, please. So first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Sipopsi for the trust um, in me in, in this presentation. And uh, obviously, uh, that took Dr. Yusuf Basiron for, for his trust 
uh, the rest of the CIPOPSI team, uh, including Padupito, Yupawichak, um, and, and others uh, as well. The thank you also for the distinguished representative of the Indonesian and the Malaysian government and the other uh, countries in, in the audience today. Um, uh, pa uh, Agus uh, Prabo, thank you very much for your, your excellent uh, presentation and for the speaker after me, Dr. Ashatardu uh, as well. Thank you very much uh, for that. So to share a bit about what is this uh, global framework principles for Palmo sustainability that uh, we have gathered here today to discuss, um, thank you very much again for, for, for listening. As such, as was mentioned earlier, the importance of this initiative by CPOPSI is such that, as we all well know, and was mentioned uh, a couple of times in the last uh, this sets of discussion presentations before, this one is the fact that with the, the world population continuing to grow, the demand for all vegetable oils uh, will continue to grow, but specifically uh, the demand for CPO will grow even faster. Uh, and as such, it is important to address some of the concerns by um, the, the European Union and others around the sustainability of palm oil. Um, the, what has been clear so far is that the, one of the bigger problems around addressing these, these, difficult, these, uh, um, these issues raised by the EU and, and, and whatnot is that we are lacking a common language to actually have that discussion, as such. What is important to start with when we talk about palm oil is that palm oil, amongst other things, is a huge instrument for the development specifically of the developing countries that are producing the palm oil. And this is what uh, CIPOPSI is, is trying to drive as part of the discussion, which is super important. Why is that important? We know that palm oil is a significant economic driver, both around um, being able to stimulate agribusinesses, both in terms of palm oil and the businesses around it starting from upstream uh, in rural areas to downstream export hubs. This is specifically important because palm oil, as opposed to other commodities, requires, as you very well know, and require the processing within country itself. So it leaves significantly more value within the country producing it than other types of commodities as such. In addition, it is a significant job drivers and a source of income, as we, as we heard earlier, for over 3 million farmers and the resulting families and the resulting ecosystem that they're driving as well. Furthermore, the palm oil um, produce is a commodity that is specifically sought after globally. And as we've heard um, a bit earlier, and as we know now, at the price point of today, it is a huge contribution to the GDP of these developing countries, even though, or not even even though, but is especially in a time of a pandemic where uh, the global economy actually um, you know, needs both this form of relatively uh, cheap vegetable oil, as well as the, the developing country needs sources of income. And finally, and this is a, an element that is often not very well discussed, is the idea that palm oil specifically focuses a lot because of the, the nature of leveraging the local economy and whatnot on the development of that local economy. And many of the largest palm oil producers also support their, their um, areas around their estates with the development of schools and with the development of, of hospitals and whatnot that are uplifting for the complete uh, ecosystem around them. To this end, we know that there have been specifically for palm oil, um, a set of robust certification schemes. So we recognize that there's MSPO by, by Malaysia, ISPO by Indonesia, RSPO that is more driven uh, as, as an element by, by uh, Europe and the West and ISCC. As such, the idea of behind starting this global framework on sustainability was not to upend any of these sustainability, uh, any of the certification schemes. But in fact, what we've realized as we were working through it is that what is lacking is a common language across these certification schemes. And often what we find there is friction when we discuss across countries between, you know, do we follow the ISP or do we follow the MSP or RSP or whatnot? This is why the global framework on sustainability for palm oil is focused on creating this common language or a framework to allow for the right discussion across the certification schemes, across countries that have not yet adopted the specific certification schemes and across 
the elements even beyond palm oil itself. The idea is that we're able to use this common language to become a lot more productive in the discussion um, around this, this very important issue and to use it as a way to drive towards much better solutions as opposed to some of the friction that we're used to in this topic. Now, what do we use as a base from this element? The elements that we use as a base from, from, from this element are the SDGs. Why do we use the SDGs? We use the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, because they are, are already a common language. And they are further recognized by the UN and further recognized by each, um, you know, by each country that is such, we feel that this is a great way to create this common language, to create this common framework, to allow us to actually engage in this conversations around productivity. We believe that the SDGs represent a set of global goals to which we are all working, as was mentioned earlier, uh, whether you're, and, and whether you are focusing on it from the country perspective, the industry, the company, or the individual. And this global framework um, principles should be measured against holistically against those SDGs. But, and in fact, going beyond the 13 elements of SDGs that we've discussed before and trying to actually encompass as many SDGs as we actually can. The idea then is that PAMO specifically lights the way, if you will, and drives forward that discussion around how do we talk about sustainability and SDGs and how do we actually um, focus on looking at productivity and sustainability across not only palm oil, but across the whole set of vegetable sectors. This is extremely important to allow us to have an unbiased discussion about how to provide the right calories, the right sustenance for the population that it keeps growing while keeping our planet um, as sustainable as possible uh, toward, for, further, for, for future generations. Now, so how did we do this? The idea to build it was to, to base on a set of principles, to create these principles, if you will. First of all, we wanted to look forward, not with a new certification scheme as we discussed earlier, but If you lost your voice. As if I think you can turn off your screen. Across the different parties, different states, establish a set of common denominators. Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry. Hello? Yes, can I can. Is this better? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Yes. Sorry about that. Sometimes we have uh, connectivity issues. So, as such, uh, what are the principles that were created? One is we want to look forward, not as a new certification scheme, but as a common language across all certification schemes uh, without appending them as we discussed. Secondly, focusing on the establishment of common denominators across all of these certification schemes, trying to look for commonality, again, as a way to look forward and as a way to create a better discussion uh, around these schemes and around how do we collectively achieve productivity. Thirdly, focusing on the creation of productive partnerships, not and specifically not discriminating against palm oil only. As we know, palm oil as, as uh, a calorie per hectare is somewhat more productive, in fact, a lot more productive than some of the other vegetable oils. And as we've seen a bit earlier with the graph, the need, and we'll discuss a bit earlier, later as well, the need for the calories that, to supply for, um, for um, population, for the population, will require a lot more land if we don't use palm oil as such. So therefore, we have to measure palm oil across other vegetable oils as well. Then we look for actionable ways in which the whole industry, producers and consumers can improve productive sustainability. And we look at new sets of technologies and new sets of approaches to allow for that. We ensure that these opportunities for improvement are identified and ultimately followed on for. And then finally, we want to repeat again that these are, the, these are principles and approaches, not actions, but rather aspirations and discussion points because we do believe that one, the whole industry and also the sovereign countries themselves should be able to chart their way as they pursue this very important goal of sustainability. So which principles uh, is, did we end up with um, as such? 
There are seven such principles. The first one being developing the partnership for sustainable development towards transparency, collaboration, uh, and specifically looking at including other vegetable oils with this framework. Two, upholding peace, justice, and strong institutions through compliance with laws and regulation. And really within this, ensuring that the countries, the producing countries are able to lead the charge in driving um, these, these kind of regulations and laws. Three, investing in innovation and technology to drive the adoption of efficient and best management practices. As we've done the research, we've seen that ultimately with the new technologies around seed, uh, GIS and other such elements, it is much easier today to ensure that palm oil is sustainable compared, for example, to the last 20 or so years. Fourth, looking at minimizing the net impact to the, the, net impact to the environment and ecosystem through the efficient use of natural resources, which is paramount to keeping, uh, to keeping up and upholding the spirits of sustainability. Five, benefiting workers and local communities by improving their living conditions and respecting their rights, which is important to ensure that, uh, that no one is actually mistreated in the production of palm oil. Six, inclusiveness for smallholders and low income consumers. Notice that we take in this approach both, both end of the value chain. We focus on smallholders first because as we realize they are often the ones that carry most of the burden of sustainability without getting the right return on that. But we also care about the low income consumers ensuring that they can actually access the needed uh, uh, product without having to pay too much. And then ultimately, of course, commitment to continuous improvement because what we are proposing here is not actually an end all be all, but is rather a path towards more and better improvements over time. The document, the seven principles are followed by nine annexes that further expand on some of these topics. One, comparison of this framework and how it aligns to existing certification schemes, keeping within the spirit and what you will see a bit later, that these certification schemes all already contain large amount of what the principles are talking about already. Two, looking at how these sets of principles will better interact with the SDGs. Three, looking at how technology, both digital, uh, around mobile payments and other things, as well as, as uh, agronomical around uh, better seeds and whatnot can help uh, improve the sustainability of PAMO. We then look at high level implementation of how we could actually implement this as such and the business model design, because we want to ensure the sustainability is not a costly endeavor, but rather something that benefits the whole industry. We further then look at how do we extrapolate this uh, framework into other vegetable oils and the importance of applying this framework to other vegetable oils to achieve the right goals of sustainability, how we then will engage with smallholders and how we engage with the United Nations. This is super important as was mentioned by Pa Agus Prabo earlier that we do align what we are doing here, what Sipopsi is doing here as alongside what the UN is looking to do in promoting the sustainability um, uh, elements quite more, more uh, profusely, profusely. And ultimately, we have also prepared a template for new countries looking to form their own national certification scheme that tying back into these, um, into these elements and the GFPSPO. As an example here of some of the annexes, we wanted to again reassure you that in fact, the various, the various certification scheme, all four of them actually tie very well into the various principles of, it, of, of GFPSPO. And the idea there is that GFPSPO actually both connects some of these things, but also uh, closes some of the gaps if some of the certification schemes uh, have yet or are approaching some of these as well. And as you see, all of the seven principles are actually covered across, across uh, th these various certification schemes. We will not expand because the discussion of new technologies can be more than the time that we have for this, you know, for the full actual uh, webinar. But the three key elements around the, the technologies to look at is one is the right verification for all stakeholders. And that is specifically addressing how do we lower the cost of verification of sustainability for those stakeholders that cannot afford to engage in very expensive audit mechanisms. Two, uh, remote engagement guidance towards uh, sustainability practices as well as compensation 
what we've seen is that today you can actually reward uh, farmers directly for their practices of sustainability and practices with the likes of e-wallets and other such uh, uh, microtransaction elements to allow them the right return for all of the efforts they're putting in and ultimately the right modern inputs and practices that by itself can increase the yields of palm oil and meet demand without, uh, without needing significant more land. All of that is covered in the document. When we look at business model exploration, this is where we really do need and call, uh, if possible, on the support, uh, support by producers as well as by consumers. In fact, there was a, a study that came out uh, last year that just identified that the smallholder produces $17 billion of the revenues for the industry or 6% of the value chain, but their profit is actually close to zero. However, the downstream, the consumer um, companies actually generate 66% of the gross profit and 52% of the operating profit. And in fact, if they were to look at really helping directly by lowering the transaction cost of helping the smallholders, we could achieve zero deforestation in quite, an, um, you know, quite a remarkable way. Therefore, we contend that business models should support smallholders, um, making sure that it doesn't increase the undue burden on them, improving the efficiencies in the value chain sponsored by downstream players and utilizing digital efficiency to ensure that this you know, connection exists. Notice we are not mentioning in this document trans, you know, traceability and transparency, but ultimately that is actually what we are striving for. Today with the right technology, we can achieve that quite easily and in a very cost efficient way. Finally, we want to uh, ensure that palm oil, as we mentioned, leads the way alongside other vegetable oils. We should not be content with the fact that there is one specific vegetable oil that is often held to a very different standard than other vegetable oils. In fact, we do know that in, if, if we do need to supply the 35.7 million hectares um, in order to meet the projected demand in 2050, it would only mean about 8% of increase in land use. On the other hand, soybean oil, if we were to try to use that to meet the same demand, will require 48% land use instead. This is why we do hope that this today is a start of a discussion to allow us to work for better sustainable palm oil to both meet the demand and do it in a much more sustainable way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fadif, for presenting the framework that was developed by the Secretariat. I think it's really interesting to read all the annexes in the document. Hope that the Secretariat of CIPOPSI could share the document very soon. Okay, then uh, we'll have question and respond after the second speaker presentation. So coming to the second presentation, we would like to invite Dr. Shata Drew Chato Padai. I will read the, uh, the bio, <coughs> biography. Dr. Shata Drew Chato Padai is a PhD in international economics. He contributed in the field of sustainability and corporate responsibility for more than two decades. He founded Solidaridad in Asia region 14 years ago, which now with 500 top professionals, providing country specific sustainability support across Asia. As you know, Solidaridad has more than 550 years of experience. Dr. Shata Drew, uh, time is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dharmasar Karu. Uh, I will just share my screen. Yes, okay. please. Uh, okay. And I hope it is visible, the presentation. Yes, I thought. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, a, I'm grateful to Dr. Yusuf Basuran and uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Dupito Samamora for giving me this opportunity to uh, voice some points about this global framework for sustainable palm oil on behalf of Solidarity. Uh, a special th uh, thanks and special mention about Honorable Madam Dr. Musdalifa Mahmood, who has been a constant guide for Solidarity on multiple issues, and her rep uh, representative, Mr. Eddie. Uh, and also uh, great to hear uh, fantastic inputs from Dr. Agus Prabhavo and uh, 
Mr. Ziv Ragoswi. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, with that, I will just start with a few questions and probably provide a couple of suggestions from our side to the CPOPC for the great work they have done, uh, you have done on this uh, global framework. I will start by, you know, this is something Solidarity started when we created the concept of fair trade in the world way back in 1980s when it was called Max Havana. So question is, what is the framework? Because, you know, there are a lot of semantics involved here. What is the framework? Why do we need a framework? I think that's a very, very critical element for us to analyze. We call it in terms of standards, framework, concepts, multiple names. The second element about is what constitutes global? Indonesia, if India, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, is it global enough? Or what exactly is global? What level of acceptance makes it global? The third thing is who defines what is sustainable palm oil? How do we know what is sustainable and who accepts it? That's the other thing. And what could be a possible way forward? These are a few of the elements I think we need to discuss. There are some examples you already mentioned about UN Sustainable Development Goals. Every country has devised its own strategy on UN SDGs and they are moving forward with it. It is a fantastic benchmark to use. And interestingly, almost all the voluntary standards we come across are based on some globally accepted benchmark or others in any case either the Rio Declaration on Environment or UN Human Rights, UN uh, Declaration on Human Rights or ILO Conventions. The other example is the Global Compact, UN Global Compact and Principles. This is the John Ruggie's special uh, work. We have been very closely involved with it. This is another example, which is globally kind of worked upon. The third element is the guideline on OECD guidelines, where a select group of countries have decided to work on uh, issues ranging from human rights, labor rights, and environment. This is another example. These are very much driven by multilateral institutions or certain specific countries. There is another example where only the producers comes together, the Gulf Cooperation Council. This is another example where not necessarily for sustainability, but for a certain kind of strategies they have come together. Then there are producer and consumer coming together was the example of International Coffee Organization, which represent almost 97% of world coffee production and almost 67% of consumption. So these are some examples, but there is another issue here. And that is the, that RSPO, and this whole discussion is primarily about standards is the Western world ultimately. Has already reached around 92% of the palm oil is RSPO certified. Europe roughly buys around eight to 10 million tons of palm oil. And it is going to go down further with the biofuel not being accepted. You know, they are not taking palm oil anymore into the biofuel, it will go down further. And you already have 14 million tons of palm oil as RSPO certified in Indonesia. So there is actually an excess supply. Not all palm oil certified as RSPO is actually sold as RSPO. So then what are we debating is the question ultimately. So if this is the case. So there are four elements which I see here. One is, you know, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, one is that already we mentioned about, uh, you know, the palm smallholders is going to be the future of palm oil supply for uh, bulk of the countries who are consuming palm oil. It is expected to become 60% by 2030. Very little of this palm oil smallholders are under any sort of sustainability scheme. And particularly the independent smallholders. And there was a figure which was given earlier by uh, uh, my previous presenter uh, about how little they produce 17 billion of revenue, but their profit is hardly there. So they can pose, they can pose new sustainability challenges in future. Secondly, the markets, you know, change because it is given certain kind of incentives and certain kind of disincentives. 
over last two decades, very large plantations got benefits out of various sustainability mechanisms. But if you look at the 92% of our SPO market in Indonesia, not more than, uh, in, 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 in the European Union, not more than 2% are from coming from the smallholders. So, or 1% or 2%. So it is not really inclusive of smallholders, the sustainability market. Third element is very little effort has been made to expand sustainable palm oil consumption in Asia. If we look at the graph here, India, even in Indonesia, I cannot buy any palm oil or a product with palm oil knowing what is sustainable and leave alone India or China or Japan. Much of its effort has been focused both from the producing countries as well as the NGO world in the European Union. And lastly, I think the national standards are critical because uh, otherwise we will have top-down uh, impl imposition of you know, regulations like European Green Deal and other things which are you know, uh, going to uh, uh, be implemented. So what is the way forward? I think from my side, there are two common uh, pathways. Uh, for this framework, common framework on sustainable palm oil. One is a government to government element. It is, it is a fantastic possibility for the framework to engage with European Union to look at addressing the fundamental issues. Common language is critical. However, we need to go a little beyond that and look at setting up a common fund to build the future of palm oil supply that is the small can the small how to help the smallholder to produce deforestation free sustainable palm oil and in line with the new traceability requirements that is coming as part of the european due diligence laws which has been set up now this the farmer smallholder farmers need support the second element is we should look for certain quota for smallholder produced palm oil in the trade agreements there are so many trade agreements happening Smallholder voices are hard. Smallholder palm oil doesn't reach European Union. There has to be a mechanism by which inclusivity agenda, which is so important for every stakeholder of smallholders are addressed there. And also there could be a CPOPC European Union joint scientific panel set up to segregate many myths which today prevails in the palm oil sector from uh, the truths about palm oil, which we heard about the kind of positive role it plays. Well, apart from that, I would say it is very crucial for mutual recognition of national standards in Asia also. There are many efforts which have been made about recognizing each other's standards, but it, Asian countries needs to take the lead in a B2B format, because ultimately the businesses have to, you know, uh, implement the standard or uh, producers have to manage the standards so, uh, and implement the standards. Businesses have to also sell the standard. So mutual recognition is critical and it could start from Asia. It is also important to have a Asian, palm, therefore the Asian Palm Oil Alliance for which we are working as organization as a facilitator is becoming very critical to facilitate improved trade uh, in sustainable and traceable palm oil within Asia. Having looked into the European situation, it is crucial to understand that India alone adds 1 million tons of additional demand in vegetable oils every year. And most of this demand is now kind of going away to other vegetable oil, not to the palm oil, like sunflower or soya. Therefore, this is very crucial. Uh, similar stories in China too. It is also important to support increase in consumption of sustainable palm oil in these countries and to shift the focus of the producing countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, which has been extensively on Europe to countries like China and India. And for that, we need an investment and challenge the for the negative campaigns. The negative campaigns are not going to be restricted to Europe alone. It will come to India as well or China as well. And lastly, I think it is very important that, you know, uh, 
there has to be a level playing field for oil, all oils and fats industry and oleochemicals in Asia, which is a point mentioned about not to discriminate palm oil against other vegetable oil. And that debate should be taken up at the Asia. So there are these two pathways, the government to government and B2B both requires, which can start with the common framework on sustainable palm oil, but it needs to move further there. And one element I, with which, which I will end the discussion from my end is very often under-recognized as we could not see even in the previous slide is the fact uh, from the previous speaker is the, is, is the fact that India is the first country in the world to recognize MSTU and ISPO as equivalent to its national palm oil sustainability standard. Your own ministers were a witness to these agreements. And this is also a kind of a very strong movement and we are working on with the Chinese stakeholders to do the same thing, uh, as well as with the Japanese stakeholders. So there is a process which is already on and that needs to be recognized as well. Thank you very much for your patience and for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashad Adru, uh, for sharing the valuable knowledge in developing sustainably, sustainability, especially in oil palm. Oil palm. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the next about 20 minutes, we will be having question and responses. Please uh, question be short and to whom the question be directed. It looks like I saw uh, a lot of questions in the chat and also in my, <clears throat> in my WhatsApp, my private WhatsApp. So I would like to try to the first reading in the question in the chat. So, uh, question to Mr. Zip about the technology, term technology. What's your opinion about the GMO? Although it's you know special when you say about small order and you mention about uh, about the technology. So, what's your opinion about this? Question from Muhammad Rosidi, Mr. Muhammad Rosidi. I'm going to shut off my video again because I don't know if you will be able to hear me otherwise, but I'm still here, right? So, um, so I, I think for GMO, for trans, for, for, for palm oil, um, there is great, interesting opportunities and they have started looking at biolistic as, as one of the technologies to actually to do that. Let's remember that some of the issues, if you talk about some of the issues about GMO normally is specifically for smallholders is that, um, especially when you look at field crops like corn or rice, using GMO makes the smallholders very susceptible to not be able to use their own seeds. In palm oil, because the seeds are lasting, the trees are lasting for 25, 27 years, even with an increased price of palm, if the productivity is that much higher, um, then there's probably a much better return for, for smallholders. Like everything else that is talked about in the technology sector, it is in, in the business model sector, it's important to evaluate the business model very specifically, which goes beyond the scope of today's session. But I think GMO offers promise if it can be done in an economically way that supports the, the smallholders. Okay. Uh, hope that uh, answered the question. And then from Mr. Nanda Ismail, I think the question is for Booth. Pasif and Dr. Satadru, what condition and strategies needed for higher approval of sustainability improvement while avoiding the confusion of different kinds of standard that have been developed so far? Pasif, you first. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So, so I, I mean, so I'm gonna. It's a tough question because it's a very political one. Yes. <laughs> as, 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 as was discussed earlier also by, by uh, uh, Dr. Satantu, right? It's a very political question. Uh, I think what, what we are aiming to do and what CIPOPSI is, 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 is aiming to do is in fact, look at um, and answer those great questions that Dr. Satantu uh, asked in the beginning is how do we create this common language to drive a very positive discussion? Now, what does that mean? It means that what I hope will happen is that we can then focus on what is necessary for sustainability. 
um, and that and how do we use those tools to allow us to cut through a bit of the friction around you know the the the, the letters in the standards and whatnot and enable us to focus on what what is real specifically when it comes for smallholders where I think the gap is even larger. So what about you? That's if we take a look about the uh, the framework and then talk about the 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 name of the words, say like about the words, terminology. So what do you think? I think it's a it's a uh, it's an interesting question. Of course, uh, one option is to look at you know certain priorities which are there uh, in the from a palm oil perspective. Uh, one priority is uh, to look at expansion of Uh, new markets, new sustainable markets. So therefore, it is crucial that how you engage with the main consumers in Asia. The other part is European Union, Green Deal, and the Due Diligence Act. How do you engage with a common language on that? And common language is a starting point because when then you start a dialogue and you start debating and deliberating on, on what do we mean by those issues. Of course, there are other issues that also needs within that common language, like uh, how to how do we see governance of these standards? How do you see, you know, the implementation of the standards? These debates have always been there. So uh, I think, but the the common framework creates a very good opportunity for initiating a dialogue. And I think the dialogue should always be the given preference. And uh, the dialogue should be with the European Union, dialogue should be with India, the dialogue should be with China using this framework and dialogue should be with the producing countries, newly and old producing countries like with the African producing countries, South American producing countries. So it provides a good platform and, 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 a, and a, an agenda to deliberate. Uh, I think continue with this, uh, Dr. Sadadru. I would like to uh, raise the question that's about Asian countries. What role can Asian countries as a major producer and consumer of palm oil play in creating a level playing field for the sustainable development of the palm oil industry? I think that's a very important question. What do you think? I think this decade will see, in my view, the major sustainability discourse for West or Europe would be uh, very limited in this decade because Europe already did set the baseline for the last two decades in setting up the sustainability debate in in, in Asia and in many other countries, in, in other continents. Uh, this decade, I think it is critical, and in that critical countries would be the four countries primarily, that is China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, primarily these four countries, they will take, because that's somewhat main producer and consuming countries. Uh, it will work on both sides uh, at the B2B level and the G2G level, it will work in that way. I think the process initiated with solid, by Solidarity and Solvent Extractor Association of India, Oil and Fat Industries Association of China, and also in collaboration with Indonesian Palm Oil Board and Malaysian Palm Oil Board with the support of Malaysian Palm Oil Primary Industries and Indonesian Coordinating Ministry, things are moving as you could see from those MOUs which were signed. But I think it is still necessary that, you know, primarily the Indonesia and Malaysia needs to probably refocus their attention a little bit on these markets, which I feel they have not received it's their due attention, probably because it is seen as a low price markets, probably it was because it was seen that, you know, uh, but whatever the reason, it is necessary at this in this decade to probably give more attention to these markets together with other stakeholders. And uh, I think that's, that's the role it will play in future because Uh, palm oil's development depends on countries like Pakistan, 
uh, Bangladesh, also the smaller countries, apart from, as I said, 1 million tons in one country in India alone, the growing per year. And that's very critical uh, uh, of vegetable oil. And this market is taken away by soybean and sunflower from other countries. So uh, please have a look at it. And uh, I would say we are eager to support those initiatives. Other option is business as usual. Please, you, have, you will be continuing with European Union activities, which will not lead us to any, any further direction where it is already moving towards electric cars, where the biofuel debate is already over. So uh, that's, that's the debate I would say we will continue in this decade. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Actually, we have a lot of questions here, but I will try to pick uh, the last one first from uh, Dato Rafi from MPIC. EU regulations are not UN endorsed global standards and as such is deemed regional and should not be applicable to product originating from this part of the world. It is a form of market uh, protection. Mr. Sadadru, what's your view on this? That's it, you can. Dr. Sadadru. I think uh, as a solidarity, we believe that European Union regulations as an organization, considering our roots are in Europe, we sincerely believe that it should be, this, this regulation should be based on more inclusive dialogue process with the producing countries. Uh, so uh, of course, if the consumers and citizens of Europe want certain kind of product, it needs to be respected, but it should not be inconveniencing uh, and creating uh, unfair trading rules for uh, producing countries. And that's precisely the reason why Solidarity is constantly trying to uh, create and an lobby with the European Commission to ensure that it is more inclusive dialogue with the producing countries. Uh, whether it will be a form of, of, of uh, you know, market protectionism or it will be a process of setting a new benchmark for sustainable production. Uh, that's to be debated and, and to be seen because it's not fully yet there. But our, our focus is ensure producing countries are included in the dialogue so that they could comment on it, they could participate in it. And secondly, leave no one behind. The small producers should not be left behind through this acts. Okay. Okay, then uh, before the last one, before I saw this from Bu Rostiana Suarto, but I will try to first pick up the question from Kurdistan, Mr. Kurdistan. Is there even a plan for CPOPC founding members, Malaysia and Indonesia, to align or merge their framework certification before aiming for a global standard? I think this question is not for Pazif or Sadadru, but uh, I think it's better to Tansri Yusuf or Pa Dipito, I think. Would you like to answer this? Because it's very important also. Tansri Yusuf or Pa Dipito? I can say it. Okay, I think I will try to answer this. Uh, actually, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia have the standard, but when we try to merge it, is not exactly what we need. So, so the best one is to uh, establish the framework right now. I think that's the answer. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a, a short time. It's about two or three minutes. I think uh, I will read the question or comments from Ibu Rostiana Suarto. We are talking about standards. We are talking about our look at the international agreement need but do not look at what customer want in national agreement demand. There is ISO, ISO organization who are very well implemented by countries. Let me speak on this. Okay, Bu Rostiana, you have a short time to mention what you're thinking. <clears throat> Still mute, but yes. yes. Okay. okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry that I came a bit late because I went to the, doc the doctor. But this morning, I would like to explain to you, I am the one who make as ISPO. So I know exactly what it is. And I know what RSPOL about. 
I know what MSPO is all about, and I am the negotiator of WTO in case of our palm oil biofuel, you see? And our negotiator is finished. Negotiation is finished. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are talking about framework, please remember, there is another big organization called ISO that know exactly what is the framework all about. Because all the time, all this time, I know that our standard is only look at ourselves. We are putting barrier on ourselves. You know, we have to be open to everybody and look what is the consumer want. You know, I am working on a, on a project under the CPOXY, which is the attainment of sustainable production. I have got the problem because I do not know what is all these standards that, that we are making, what are their have to, what is the objective of it. They're look, making a standard looking at different ways and nobody is, is buying our, our palm oil because our standard is very different to each other and do not aim any market. You see, during the discussion in, in the WTO, European doesn't even approve Malaysian standard, Indonesian standard, whatever standard. What do they approve if RSPO? Why RSPO? Because RSPO is NGO, they are transparent. They are looking at the product. You see, we do not even look at what WTO want. So our standard cannot be discussed in WTO because we are not talking about product. We are not talking about Annex 1 or TBT. We are not talking about anything. We're talking about ourselves. I think that is the weakness of our, our, our standard. If we do want, do, do want to make a global framework, look at the ISO. Even European at the beginning, on our negotiation, they do not accept that their, TB, their, their right to is TBT. But at the end, when they implement the, implement the standard, it is TBT. So why don't we look at TBT? Why don't we look at ISO? Why don't we look at all the agreement that we signed to? If you're looking at, at SDG, it's too big. It's talking about national. It's not talking about companies. Standard is talking about a company. Not the whole, the whole Indonesia or the whole Malaysia. Yes, Rishana, we understand about that. Can you just make a shorter? Yeah, I think SDG is 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 not for for only company, but for sectors that related yes. to the government. So, so maybe for the future, we better make a standard and look at what consumer want. Not even our standard, even our SBO, do not calculate greenhouse gas emission. And we are committed to net zero emission in 2030. Thank you. Yes, thank you for Riasna. I think there's a valuable uh, support to us. And then we will try to make it a uh, very good global framework. I think for the last question, I think this is very important. Also, a uh, question from uh, Mr. Edwin Shah. Uh, to PASIF, challenges for sustainability standard developed by UN facing the net zero emission requested based on the climate change COP26 for Indonesia in 2060. Is it technical possible? Technically possible? What do you think, PASIF? Well, Although it's not exactly match with your, you know, I think what I, we are talking about, but try to answer this yeah, one. No, no, <laughs> I, I think it's a good question. I, I, I think I cannot offer at this point, if it's technically possible, as it needs to be studied, but I would offer an approach, right? What we're trying to do first is, so if you think about how to achieve these things, there's three steps in my mind to achieve net zero or, or in reality, a few other things as well, right? Number one is to have the right set of discussions, a right set of people around the table to are actually productively working together to actually try to develop ideas. Number two, approving those ideas. And number three, implementing those ideas. The start of today and what we're hoping to do for the, for the next year together with the UN, uh, you know, as such in terms of the questions is to start having the right discussion. I think as we mentioned earlier uh, as well by, by, uh, by Ibu Rosadina is that if we don't have the right discussions, then we are anyway stuck. People won't accept what we're doing. Friction starts, we can actually, actually move forward. What I hope is with this, uh, with this uh, uh, common language, let's call this that, we're able to have the right discussion of how to achieve net zero and then start identifying the right technologies, approaches and whatnot to enable us to do so. Yes. So I, I know that's not the answer you want, but that is the yeah. answer. That I <laughs> okay, that's a close one. So 
Actually, I'm sorry that we are running out of time for questions and responses. And we are now coming to the end of the webinar. I would like to invite Mr. Rubito Simamura, the Deputy Executive Director of CIPOPSI for the closing remarks. Mr. Rubito Simamura, time is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Pawi Chak, our able moderator uh, for this uh, morning. Um, let me uh, say a few things before I conclude uh, the meeting and also say thanks to our uh, speakers and participants. In my opinion, one of the most important messages we hear this morning is that uh, palm oil has led vegetable oils by very viable example of sustainability. From there, uh, Sipopsi takes another leap by developing a global framework for all palm oil producing countries to follow. This framework is not meant to be a certification scheme, but it can inspire palm oil producing countries to have their own schemes adapted to their national needs and requirements. We are mindful as well that this framework will be interpreted differently by many parties, but I think you know the most important one and the most important objective is that uh, the framework should be the basis for further dialogue. I think we have, we have heard uh, a lot of suggestions uh, from our two main speakers today uh, on, that, uh, uh, in, on the importance of dialogue uh, forward. There are three takeaways uh, we talk, uh, from our webinar in my opinion. First is that is it inevitable for all vegetable oils to have sustainability standards as the subtitle of our webinar suggests? If we are true to our commitment to SDGs and other international commitments, then all vegetable oils should have their own standard. Sustainability is a norm for all oils. This global framework can be used to develop one including through the auspices of the UN. With this framework, uh, palm oil producing countries through CPOPC would like to promote collaboration and, and not competition among edible oils. It is not a coincidence that the first principle of the framework is about partnership. UNDP's participation in this discussion sends a clear signal to us uh, that uh, in, uh, towards the direction or in, in UNDP's work for the framework to be the basis for transformative dialogue to progress with SDGs and improve palm oil governance. The contribution of all stakeholders, such as uh, a prominent organization and Solidaridad is indispensable to achieve our common objective and ambition, a global standard for all oils. Some ideas on how we can define uh, global, uh, global has been highlighted by Dr. Satadru for our uh, you know, future consideration and discussion. Second, perhaps, is that uh, what is the next step for palm oil producing countries? Asia to lead, as suggested by Dr. Satadru. India, Indonesia, and Malaysia have shown an excellent example to have mutual support and recognition of their mandatory schemes called uh, EPOS for India, ISPO for Indonesia, and MSPO for Malaysia. This example should not only be applied between palm oil producing countries, but also between palm oil producing countries and producers of other major oils. Palm oil producing countries should consolidate their position first to allow wider dialogue. That way we can address the long imbalance scrutiny on the sustainability of palm oil, but not on other oils. The third and the last perhaps, Pawichak, is that uh, is there a viable solution for palm oil producing palm oil major producing and also major consuming countries. I think has been also discussed uh, quite ex extensively by our two speakers. Discrimination or sanction, as we have seen from some major consumers in the name of narrow concept of sustainability, such as deforestation, neither acceptable nor workable and fair. That way, uh, the way forward is to create, uh, to co-create solution by strengthening sustainability standard using SDGs as the main parameters. Palm oil producing countries have their own national schemes and it is incumbent for uh, major consumers to accept that fact and even help improve the schemes in a spirit of partnership, but not to unilaterally decide on what is considered sustainable or not. It is not our approach or a step that we can accept. Finally, uh, our special appreciation and thanks 
to Pak Agus Prabowo from UNDP Indonesia, our good respected friend, Dr. Satadru, and to our consultant, uh, Dr. Jeff Haragoski. It would be a remiss uh, for me not to thank all participants, uh, active participants, and also the CPOPC Secretariat colleagues uh, for this successful webinar. Thank you all and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you, Padubita, for the con conclusive closing remark. I think it's easier for us to take home messages and also the summary of all. Uh, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, the webinar is well done. Time is up. On the, on the behalf of CPOPC, we would like to thank to all of honorable guests for recommendation and supporting, to speaker for good presentation, and all particip participants for attending the webinar. Once again, thank you. Salam. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satadru. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pak Agus, UNDP. Thank you, Bagus. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bagus. Thank you. Very inspiring statement, Bagus. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Earth, a planet with 510 million square kilometers of large surface where peatlands cover 3% of the blue planet area in 175 countries. For the past three centuries, world population take advantages of using peatlands for fuel and agriculture. This caused 10 to 20% of the global peatlands to have disappeared. In the humid tropics such as the Southeast Asia, regional environmental and topographic conditions enable peat to form under conditions of high precipitation and high temperature. Here, peat soil has a high carbon content and can burn under low moisture conditions. Dry season makes it prone to wildfires. With this type of event occurring naturally, Southeast Asia countries with large tropical peatlands such as Indonesia and Malaysia issued peat land management and protection policies. Indonesia has established a dedicated agency for peat land management, Badan Restorasi Gambut, or the Peat Land Restoration Agency, who is working to restore degraded peat lands in seven provinces. Malaysia has a national action plan for peat lands management sustainably since 2011. In the Northern Hemisphere, temperate peat land has crucial use for energy. About 2 million European citizens enjoy the warmth during winter through heating machines driven by energy from peat. While tropical peatland is a planting medium to increase population living standards and eradicate poverty. In Indonesia and Malaysia, which together produce around 85% of the world's palm oil, more than 3 million smallholders generate income from oil palm. This crop is planted on suitable peatlands, but takes less than 15% of all oil palm plantations in both countries. If we talk about peatland in these two palm oil producing countries, it will be insuperable from improving the degraded peatland. Here's why. As a common phenomenon that occurs all over the world, Indonesia and Malaysia experience the conversion of forest land into non-forest land. The loss of natural vegetation around the peatlands caused disruption on overall ecosystem and hydrology of the landscape. Here, where the degraded peatlands are flammable and in shallow peat, the growing of crop like oil palm has been an ecological and productive choice. Like plants, oil palm tree absorbs carbon dioxide. Utilization of degraded peatlands with proper technical culture and water level management for oil palm plantations has been proven to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, the oil palm plantations are improving the degraded peatlands, resulting in less GHG emissions.